His transition to more serious roles was inevitable, though his success was never truly repeated in Hollywood. Now on the Biography Channel, a very private man, Dirk Bogart. conveyed with thought um, and people just read his thoughts and uh, and they were in, engaged by his, his performance. He was a, for me a good and great man but he wasn't a goody goody that's for sure. He was wicked. Such an extraordinarily um, rare man. I will never know his mystery. Look at all this muck and slime it makes you, it makes you feel sick. No, it's not. Why can't you use what brains you've got? Oh. Sister Virtue. Dirk Bogard's career went through several extraordinary changes. He transformed himself from a matinee idol to serious actor and acclaimed writer. Born in Hampstead in 1921, he spent an idyllic childhood in London and in Sussex. He made his first forays into the theatre in 1939 for The Queue in Richmond and Amersham Rep. But his acting career was interrupted by the Second World War. In 1940, Dirk left his family to serve in Europe and the Far East. His war lasted for five years, during which time he rose to the rank of Major in Intelligence. Dirk had been deeply affected by the war, but he didn't reveal this until later on in life. After the war, Dirk returned to acting, and by 1948, he'd been offered his first starring role in the film, the Esther Lepches. Waters. You know, once upon a time, the Latches owned a lot. Do you know what? I'm gonna put the Latches back where they belong. And do you know why? Because I'm lucky. Whilst making Esther Waters, Dirk was signed up by rank on a seven-year contract. They set about perfecting a matinee idol image, casting him in a series of roles that played on his good looks. Typical of these was the role of war hero in the film Appointment in London. Yes, sir, I think so. As far as I can see, we got it all right. Had a bit of trouble with the fighter, got the rear gunner. The whole place has got to be wiped out. Dirk played alongside a young actor, Tony Forward, seen here addressing the troops. The squadron will rendezvous over the wash with the main bomber stream at 18,000 feet. You will then set course for the Dutch coast. Tony soon gave up acting to become Dirk's manager and lifelong companion. His son, Gareth, spent much of his childhood in Dirk's company. Uh, Dirk was always the one who came on my side when things got rough. <laughs> Uh, he was the kind of um, very good uncle stroke godfather who, if my pa was uh, giving me a rough time about the school report, for good reason, I should think, um, Dirk would try and alleviate it by giving me a bottle of Guinness or something, you know, which I liked. <laughs> in 1954, Dirk got a part in Doctor in the House, a hugely successful film made by the producer Betty Box and director Rafe Thomas. Oh, excuse me, I wonder if you could tell me where the students go, please. Well, certainly not in here. <laughs> where are you looking for? Well, actually, I'm new, and I just wonder if you could perhaps tell me where I ought to go. Oh, you want the medical school. That's right over the other side. We had to try and find people who could make a comedy who were good actors and who weren't going to make it funny funny because the first doctor we tried to make into a real picture that had some sort of integrity and wouldn't frighten people about hospitals. People were very frightened about hospital pictures there and so we cast Dirk because he's a wonderful straight man. You stuck too? Yeah. What page is subacute appendicitis? Oh, I have no idea. I'm looking for the chest. It was that film that made him, certainly in terms of the UK, a real big pop superstar. I mean, he was 
mobbed wherever he went. Dirk Bogard, John Mills and Glynis Johns drove round together. They were pursued by an eager crowd and in order to avoid a rough house they kept on the move. Wisely perhaps, for anything can happen when film stars meet their fans. He was too, almost too good looking in those early days to do the sort of things he wanted to do and of which he eventually did later. How would you describe your looks to a blind person? Scrawny, good eyes, got those from my mother. Average, I'd say, a little more than average, because I've got a quality inside me which alters the face. And I've had a long, long business training with that. Oh, come, Sydney, show some taste for once. Isn't she truly delightful? A pretty little doll. In 1958, Dirk played Sidney Carlton in Rafe Thomas's version of A Tale of Two Cities. Dirk later credited the camera operator Bob Thompson with a piece of very sound advice. They finished shooting for the day and he notices the cameraman watching him. And he says to the man, why are you watching me? And the man says, well, I'm fascinated because you really don't know anything, do you? You're not really an actor. You have no idea where the camera is. You have no idea about lighting. You have no idea about sound. I'm amazed you've become a star. And rather than getting insulted, as many would, Dirk said, all right, if that's true, teach me. It is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest I go to than I have ever known. He, I think he was very good at Sidney Carton. I think it was the ideal casting. And I think it was, perhaps for me, it was the second best performance he ever gave. In 1960, Dirk decided to try his luck in Hollywood. He tested the waters with Song Without End, a biopic about the composer Franz Liszt. Hollywood was a total disaster because, again, you would think it would have been all right. He looked good. He had a good English following. He went out to do a film about Liszt, and it was just awful. The screenplay was awful. The, it was, you know, hello, Beethoven, how's Mozart? Have you seen Wagner this morning? It was a real shocker. His co-star was the model-turned-actress, Capucine. That was very, very much in love with her, I think. Um, so was I, as a matter of fact, but uh, he, he stood a better chance than me. And um, so it went on, and I think that uh, he, he did propose to her, and I think that had she said yes, he, he would have married her, and, and possibly then had children, which I think is perhaps an underlying sadness in his life. Although Dirk has written that he fell in love with several women during his life, he never married. <laughs> First of all, the films were, by and large, pretty terrible, although there are exceptions. And secondly, he was trapped in this image of the J. Arthur Rank, handsome, fighting hero. And occasionally he gets into the black leather and does movies like Singer Not the Song. And you can see, you know, he is clearly moving towards Pasolini or Fellini, desperately trying to break this awful little England of J. Arthur Rank. In 1961, he seized an opportunity to shatter his clean-cut image. When we were married, we had no secrets from each other. He played a gay barrister in the film Victim at a time when homosexuality was Why illegal. Seeing him? He was getting too fond of me. Are you sure you weren't getting too fond of him? Answer me. They'd asked a lot of uh, actresses to do the part, but most people were terrified of the subject was very prissy in those days, frightfully middle class, the film industry. So I was quite late on the scene, and uh, I jumped at the chance, since many of one's friends were gay and so on. Darling, darling, come home, it's cold. I know that Dirk fought a lot for the scene that happens between the wife and the husband, and in fact I think he had something to do with the writing of it, when he actually says, I put him out of the car because I wanted him. And it's 
very sexual, and it's a tremendous shock for her. All right, you want to know. I shall tell you. You won't be content until you know, will you? Till you ripped it out of me. I stopped seeing him because I wanted him. Do you understand? Because I wanted him! People have speculated that Dirk was himself gay, but this was a subject he refused to be drawn on. However, he did make it clear that although he lived with Tony Forward, their relationship was platonic. As I saw it, this was um, a, a profound friendship based uh, both in a professional way um, and a personal way. And I, I think that was the only important uh, factor of it. And I would suggest that that was the only factor of it anyway. When you and Forward are here at home in the evening and everybody, well, so when, we, when we've gone, do you have post-mortems on how the day has Well, if, 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 you're, if you're inferring that we might sit down knitting and pulling rugs, forget it. That doesn't happen I wasn't, No, I wasn't inferring that. I was asking... Um, no, there are no post-mortems. In uh, a part of Backcloth, you say this. The hermit crab syndrome was firmly fixed. Uh, I dread and still do dread possession. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever possessed you. No. I think you have to have someone to talk to. But I don't talk very much. I get loquacious on aeroplane. But I'm certain that in the shell, and you haven't cracked it yet, honey. In 1962, Dirk acted in the first great film of his career, The Servant. Directed by Joe Losey and written by Harold Pinter, The Servant was a masterful allegory of changing attitudes in the 60s. You've had experience of this kind of work, have you? I've been in service for the last 13 years, sir. The last few years, I acted as a personal manservant to various members of the peerage. Oh. I was with uh, Viscount Barr until about five weeks ago. Oh, Lord Barr. I think he loved playing Barrett. I think he loved that kind of um, queeny, bitchy side, that dominating side, uh, very much. Um, and and uh, and the chemistry with me was very good. I think. I think he liked that, and and I I liked what he was doing. And he he transformed himself into Barrett. He was a a spooky little guy. Just a Beaujolais, sir. But a good bottler. A good what? Bottler. And he was the first actor to make the camera see him think. Before Dirk, actors reacted on screen. They simply did films like photographed plays. What Dirk said was, no, no, we start with the camera and we wait and we let the camera watch us not doing anything. It was so good to be around him because he knew what he was good at. He knew about his looks and his reactions and he knew how to coach you to do things that was so, by that time, second nature to him. Now look, Barrett, don't you forget your place. You're nothing but a servant in this house. A servant? I'm nobody's servant. Who'll furnish the old place for you? who painted it for you? Who does the cooking? Who washes your pants? Who cleans the bathhouse after you? I do! I run the old bloody place for where I get out of it! Nothing! Now listen, Barrett, look. I know all about you, sir. No, look, listen, I am grateful, honestly. Yeah, no, honestly, yeah. don't be daft. You know I am. Yeah, I believe you. I... I don't know what I'd do without you. Well, then go and pour me a glass of brandy. What happens with the servant is you suddenly get dark. Dirk, you suddenly see that's what he would have done had he been European, had he been Scandinavian, he would have done a lot of that. And then, of course, from the servant on, he starts to work more and more with really good directors. Dirk went on to make three more films with Joe Losey. But by 1969, he'd had enough of the British film industry. He moved to Italy, where he met the great film director Luciano Visconti, who cast him in Death in Venice. 
Visconti fell in love with that face. And I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful part for, for Dirk. And I mean, the, the whole thing of Aschenbach, Dirk's career. And ironically, he never got the Oscar, but he should have done. Dirk and Visconti showed the film to its American sponsors. They were met by what they thought was an awestruck silence. But they weren't. They were horrified. They were appalled. They couldn't believe what they'd seen. And so the lights went up, and Visconti thought he'd better say, um, <clears throat> do you have any questions? Nothing. Silence. And they all just looked at each other. And everybody was sort of crouched with horror. They spent $100,000 on what they called an old man chasing a kid's backside. That was exactly the phrase they used. But one man, whose name I won't mention, was the domestic distributor at the time for America. He felt it incumbent upon himself to say something. So he got up and he said, I have to say that I think that the score is just great. Who did the theme music, Mr. Viscati? And Viscati looked rather delighted that somebody had spoken to him, at least with a kindness. And so the, the music is by Gustav Mahler. And Mr. X, Y, Z said, well, gentlemen, I think we should sign him. Exhausted by the filming of Death in Venice, he and Tony Forward decided to settle down in France, where they were often visited by Charlotte Rampling. It was an old Bastide up in the hills above Grasse. Beautiful old Bastide on two two floors, with the land going down in steps with olive trees on it. And there was something quite magical about it. They had a wonderful way of making beautiful homes, Tony and Dirk. This was the time when Dirk started writing. And I wonder if that would have ever have happened in the same way if he, if he hadn't been there, because this turned into then his main professional interest, really, for the rest of his life. Dirk had entered a whole new phase of his career, in which he wrote a number of autobiographies and novels. The very first of the books is concerned a postillion struck by lightning, and there's no doubt about it that it surprised an enormous number of people who did not expect such a wonderfully evocative um, book about childhood. He was really uh, insistent that people described him as a, a writer um, and a former actor but he was enticed to make the occasional film. One of these was Night Porter, a strange and dark film in which he played an ex-Nazi officer who meets one of his former prisoners, played by Charlotte Rampling. It always intrigued me enormously that somebody who has been in the war could um, play the character like he played in Night Porter. I found that really very bizarre. We never talked about it because it was just too bizarre. I didn't really want to talk to him about it. He had his own reasons for doing it. The Second World War had left an indelible mark. He'd been among the first of the Allied troops to witness the horror of Belsen. I think it was on the 13th of April. I'm not quite sure what the day was. In Fort when we opened up uh, Belsen camp, um, which was the first concentration camp any of us had seen. We didn't even know what they were. We'd heard vague rumours that they were. I mean, nothing could be worse than that. The gates were open, and then I realised that I was looking at Dante's Inferno. I mean, I, re I, I, I still haven't seen anything as dreadful. I never will. I can't really describe it very well. I don't really want to. Um, I went through some of the hearts. And they were tears and tears of, of rotting people. But some of them were alive underneath the rot and were lifting their heads and trying. <laughs> you didn't make me bluff, didn't it? Trying to do the victory thing. That, that was the worst. Sorry. Dirk had to leave his beloved France in 1986. Tony Forward had contracted Parkinson's and cancer and had to be taken to England for treatment. Anyone who lived such a, had the good fortune to live in such a place would never really want to leave it at all for, for any reason at all. Um, 
until, of course, many years later. They, they were there for 17 years and uh, in, in the end, of course, had to leave it um, through illness, really. Dirk wrote about Forward's death in his biography, A Short Walk from Harrods. One night, helping Anna to turn him, he made signs that he wanted to speak. And when I pressed my face to his chest, it was to say that if we'd done such a thing to a dog, we'd have been arrested. The power had gone. The final burst of furious strength ebbed away. He never spoke again. Dirk had witnessed suffering and death, both during the war and with the death of friends. Those incidents together uh, confirmed to Dirk that it was vital to introduce uh, voluntary euthanasia and to have it legalized in this country so that people who wanted to die should be enabled to die. We took an advertisement with him giving a message and it was so effective that uh, we always had uh, several applications for membership from new people. So he was a tremendous asset to us as a society in general, in the movement in general. In 1990, Dirk made his last film, These Foolish Things, with Jane Birkin. Dirk plays a man who is dying of cancer. He saw the rough cut of the film and he felt he could give more. And he added a scene that was a personal scene about um, being in such pain that he ripped up the, the cushion and the and the feathers flew. This scene that was really practically written by, well, was written by Dirk, where he obviously wanted to express himself fully about the solitude of dying. In the last years of his life, he wrote for The Telegraph. His first article was a review of Russell Harty's book, A Grand Tour. After a short while, uh, back came a notification from Dirk Bogard that indeed he might be interested in writing a piece about this book. And in shortly after that came uh, an extraordinary piece of wonderfully exciting reviewing. And it was exciting because it seemed to have, apart from uh, one or two rather immediately obvious things like atrocious spelling and um, words all over the place, it had that great thing which was honesty and truth. It had this smack and um, the sound of this resounded around the building for a while. In 1996, Dirk suffered a stroke. John Coldstream was one of a few visitors. You know, I did see him uh, at the very, very worst of times. There was, there was no despair. There was quite a lot of raging against dying of the light, as it were, but uh, there was no despair. What was nice about him was he always told you to piss off when he got fed up with you. I used to visit him in London and then he used to fidget after about an hour. He's got fed up and said, oh, well, off you go then. He's a very discerning sort of man. He, he, could, he could see into you. Uh, he knew what made you tick. He knew... Uh, he had rather quick judgments about people and very intuitive and, and uh, uh, insightful. On May the 8th, 1999, Dirk died of a heart attack in his home in Chelsea. He had this inter eternally young spirit, like some, some people do. He, 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 he never grew old, even when he was ill, he was never old. He's not to be violated. He's somebody where pride is, takes a very great part of his, of, of his life, which is why when people misinterpret, then you feel cross because because a mysterious man he will always be. Tomorrow afternoon on the Biography Channel, the life story of another British-born star who did rather well in Hollywood, Elizabeth Taylor. That's at two.